welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and uh, we're going to continue on my Existence of God series, on specifically on the hiddenness of God argument for atheism. Um, this, uh, I had to break it up. It was a, The show was way too long for my part one. I was originally planning to do part one and then part two, and that would be it for the hiddenness of God. Um, but um, it looks like it's too long, so I'm going to have to break it up into three parts. So what I'm doing is part 1A, uh, that's already filmed, and now I'm picking up from where we left off in part 1A. Here's part 1B of the hiddenness of God argument. So uh, picking up straight from where we left off. So enjoy the show. Okay, so let's move on to premise number five here. Um, so premise number five, uh, once again, states, well, if God exists and he's perfectly loving in the way we've described in the previous premises, uh, as per premise four, well, then it's obviously the case that God is, quote unquote, what Schellenberg calls open to reciprocal, positively meaningful conscious relationships um, with any and all NRNBs or non resistant non believers who are, one, not resisting God, two, capable of such a relationship with God, and three, finally, in a position to participate in such a relationship. Um, and I, I modify it and say, or alternatively, forget about non-resistant non-believers. There are controversial concepts, as we'll find out when we assess this premise. Minimally, uh, God is required to, uh, to be open to these kind of relationships with any and all real seekers. Keep it nice and simple. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is start to clarify some of these technical terms that J.L. Schellenberg gives us here. And the first is, okay, great. Well, what the heck does it mean for God to be, quote unquote, open to these recipro to these relationships? Well, Schellenberg means something very watered down and specific. So by that, by open, Schellenberg means to say that God must minimally make sure that, quote unquote, there is nothing he nor anyone else ever does or anything you could add, ever does in a broad sense, including omissions, that would have the result of making such relationships unavailable to the other via preventing the non-resistant non-believer or the real seeker, as we're going to go with the minimal standard, from being able to relate personally to God, um, even should they then try. So this is Schellenberg's notion of being open, God's being open. Notice that this is a watered-down term, right? It's less controversial or speculative on uh, Schellenberg's part. And he's, he's realized this over the years from 1993. He's modified his argument to make it stronger. And that's what he's doing with this open, right? He's not saying, look, God must actively seek. He must initiate or promote a personal relationship with the other person who's capable of it. He's not responsible, he's not arguing that God's responsible to do that, um, though he probably would think that he is. He's just saying minimally, God just has to be open in a passive sense, meaning he has to ensure that there's nothing that would prevent um, a real seeker or a non-resistant non-believer from entering into that relationship and participating in it with God. So that's what open means here. Uh, now, one thing to notice with this premise, um, probably contradicting what J.L. Schellenberg himself would want to say, is notice that there's no temporal coordinates, right? So usually she someone like Schellenberg would probably argue, well, look, God's got to be open always at all times. He can never, there's never a time when God can be closed, for example, to having one of these relationships with any and all real seekers. Uh, or non-resistant non-believers, whatever term you want to go with. Um, so God must always be open at all times, and Schellenberg is quite explicit about this requirement. Now, I've taken that out. I've watered down that, and I, I've also done the same in premise six when we get to that below, um, uh, which is kind of an update. So, yeah, if some of your slides are different, um, this is the new update. What I'm saying now is there's no temporal factor. I'm... I'm I think it's a stronger or in a more easily defensible statement for the atheist, being as charitable as they can to Schellenberg, who, who does, I think he's right about having this standard, yeah, God should be open at all times, always for real seekers. But I think that's picking a fight that, uh, that might be controversial. Some theists 
would say, well, that's bull BS. You don't need to do that. How presumptuous you atheists and skeptics are. And they might, that's an, a, a chance for a debate. And it's an unnecessary debate. So I've strengthened the atheist case. I've made the atheist claim weaker and therefore easier to defend by taking out this claim that God has to always be open at all times to a relationship with real seekers um, and or non-resistant non-believers. And instead, I've simply said that, look, God has to be open to these, um, to these kinds of relationships with any and all non-resistant non-believers or real seekers, as I call them, um, minimally before any point and or points of what I call no return. And I define that as, look, that any point or points uh, whereby God's not being open uh, to these relationships would unjustifiably hinder or prevent a relationship from being formed when it ought to have been formed um, to the detriment, obviously, of the real seeker or the non-resistant non-believer and presumably to the detriment of God and or possibly others as well. Uh, so that's what I mean. I, I weakened it to say instead of any and all times, um, which I think is true. I think Schellenberg is right to argue for this. I think that God would be open at all times with real seekers to be in a relationship with them, uh, especially in the watered-down sense of open. But nonetheless, just to help the atheists make their... I think they can make their argument um, without even needing to get into the debate, well, would God be open at all times? No, no. We just minimally need to say, look, he, he has to be open uh, at any points of no return. Point and or points, if plural, if there is plural, of no return. Um, that's all we need to argue for. And again, there it may be that, you know, this this premise doesn't isn't restricted. It doesn't say that God doesn't need to be always open. Maybe it could. Uh, this is the way I've stated the premise is consistent with Schellenberg's idea. If all those points of no return have to be at every moment or something like that. Uh, again, it's a minimal thing, right? So minimally, he has to be open at uh, before points of no return. Um, but maybe he also has to be open at more than just those points. He has to be op open at all time moments or something like that, like Schellenberg argues. So either way, look, Schellenberg, it's the best of both worlds. Schellenberg... Uh, has his correct insight, in my opinion. If he wants to argue God's got to be open to relationships at all times, great. The, the way I've stated the premise doesn't deny that. But it, by the same token, it doesn't make that claim and thereby have to take on that burden of proof. It just claims, well, minimally, God just has to be open at any and all, uh, before any and all points of no return. Um, outside of this, Maybe God has to be open. Maybe God can be closed. I'm not, I don't think the atheist needs to claim either way. And this argument will still uh, succeed or fail uh, in the same way as it would even if we adopted Schellenberg's stronger claim uh, in terms of God having to be always open at all moments in time with real seekers and stuff like that so and just bear in mind so by points of no return point and or points of no return um this could be sometime in the afterlife so obviously that would be a hard thing for the atheists to prove in terms of the empirical premise it would be impossible they don't know what happens in the afterlife um however again we're trying to steal men for the atheists so they could argue that well look there are points of no return in this life there there are points where quote unquote um a relationship ought to be formed they can argue um and that's and uh if it's not being formed at that point that constitutes a point of no return so it's any point where it's unjustifiably hindered or prevented from being in a relationship with god um uh, preventing a relationship from being formed when it ought to be formed. And obviously, J.L. Schellenberg and atheists are going to make the case that, well, there's uh, there are times in this earthly life when a relationship ought to be formed. And as Schellenberg's going to argue, and that's at all times, anytime you're a real seeker or non-resistant non-believer, you've got to be in that relationship. That's a point of no return. You ought to be there. Uh, a relationship ought to be formed. So 
um, you see how it works there, hopefully. Um, it, it's This is my attempt to steel man the atheist argument. Hopefully it succeeds there. Oh, sorry, just to clarify what I was saying there quickly as an update. Oh my goodness. So yeah, so point of no return can be defined in this life as any, any point where it's unjustifiably hindered or prevented from participating or actualizing a relationship with God when a relation, such a relationship ought to be formed. And in these circumstances, God must is responsible to be open to those relationships uh, at these points of no return. Um, and if that's, as Schellenberg says, that's at any and all times, great, grand and groovy. If you want to be able to prove that as the atheist, I think you can. I think Schellenberg succeeds. Um, but nonetheless, we don't have to get into that debate necessarily. We just have to say, well, at any and all points of no return. Maybe the points of no returns are all times. Maybe it's less than that. Maybe there are times when God can be closed. Uh, we're not going to get into that. We just know that God's got to be open at any and all points of no return. Whenever a relationship ought to be formed, um, then God's got to be open to that with a real seeker. Ought to be formed with a real seeker, then God's got to be open to that. That's a modification here. Um, part of the problem with me, uh, I'm, I'm kind of rushing and stuff like that. So I'm writing and podcasting at the same time. Uh, that's a recipe for disaster. So obviously I'm finding flaws and I'm having to go back, rewrite and re-record and stuff like that. So, so yeah, just bear in mind, this is the most up-to-date aspect. Uh, before I post the written part, I'm going to have all the updates uh, put in and corrected for you guys as well. So um yeah cool so so that's the next qualification or clarification i wanted to offer here um okay great so what about so what the heck is this quote unquote uh the nature of this reciprocal positively meaningful conscious relationship as schellenberg defines it and schellenberg is quite explicit he says that this is an explicit relationship it embodies what christians call pure bliss or uh, what some have called, like Keith Ward, the iconic vision, right? So it's a, a deep, inherently good relationship or state of affairs between two, two or more people, whereby one is fully conscious and cognizant of being in this relationship. So by definition, this is what he's saying. This is how it becomes inherently good. It's got to be fully conscious, fully cognizant of being in the relationship. And that's what uh, Schellenberg calls an explicit relationship. You know, you have this oh, deep interaction between the two. You know what's going on you, with the other. You know how you're relating to them. Uh, you fully understand it as best you can. Uh, you fully understand it, um, period. And um, in terms of the divine human relations, that includes things like ascribing the proper value and appreciating the value of God. Worship. Worth a ship in the Old English ascribing the proper worth that god that relationship oh it's so beautiful and that's what we call worship um that's so meaningful for humans we need to ascribe the proper worth and value to things like god and vice versa it's good for god to ascribe the value that we deserve as human beings obviously it's not to the same we're not as valuable as god um, but we are immensely valuable in and of ourselves so appreciating value appreciating our, our worth as persons within the relationship and appreciating the value of the relationship that we have these are things that all require direct consciousness a conscious cognizant relationship uh according to schellenberg and i think he he's bang on but uh we'll get to that in a moment um but yeah so this is what schellenberg means by this reciprocal uh, conscious, uh, personal relationship that's deeply meaningful. Um, moreover, he says, look, it involves valuing that relationship for its own sake. The relationship must be valued intrinsically. And this is a conscious thing on your part. Uh, it's not merely for the sake of something else. It's not instrumentally valuable. You've got a conscious go, I'm in a relationship with God and that is intrinsically valuable in and of itself. Um, what's more, this relationship would be has to be eternal. It can't be temporary, uh, at least eternal in the future. Uh, so it would never cease, and it would uh, continuously get better and better. It would grow over time, which is exactly what we say happens in self, the state of salvation. Uh, and this gets better for both parties, right? As we know, grow and know God more and more, 
uh, God gets to interact with us in more and more new ways. So God is growing in his appreciation and love and deepening um, in his relationship with us as well. Um, and furthermore, Schellenberg says this relationship must be entirely voluntary. There's no coercion, undue uh, force or selfish motivations in terms of God or the creatures. Um, it's both perfectly mutual, mutual respect and mutual beneficial love that motivates these relationships. This is what most Bible-believing Christians teach is heaven, or uh, even better, the end state. Uh, this is what a salvific relationship with God is. So as Bible-believing Christians, uh, we're saying, J. Schellenberg, amen. Um, exactly, exactly right. We couldn't agree more with um, your definition of these deeply meaningful relationships and what you mean by it. Okay, great. Um, so with that said, there is one caveat here in terms of uh, the relationship aspect and it needing to be fully conscious. Oops, some philosophers object to that. So for example, the Christian philosopher Terence Cuneo has written a paper that I'm going to post up for free on my blog site for you guys. So go to my blog and you can read, read what he has to say in his own words. But you know, for example, he says that, look, no, God doesn't need to be open at all times uh, to non-resistors or to real seekers um, and engage in a meaningful, conscious relationship with God. He thinks that, no, Schellenberg's wrong. Non-conscious relationships with God are perfectly sufficient and adequate. Um, you can have non-conscious relations with God, and that's all God needs to be open to. So that's what Terence Cuneo says, right? He, he says, look, quote unquote, to be in a position to participate in a meaningful conscious relationship with God might take an honest and extended effort. Maybe it takes time. You need to develop that. And so God is closed to consciously relating to you at certain times until you grow up. But in the meantime, it's sufficient for him because you're a real seeker, because you're a non-resistant non-believer, it's sufficient to have for him to have non-conscious, really meaningful relationships with you. And the way uh, Terence Cuneo uh, argues for this, and uh, he basically says, he points to verses in the Bible, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 34 to 40, which says, quote unquote, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and yet you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer Jesus, and saying, Lord, when the heck did we ever see you hungry? What? <laughs> And feed you? No, we didn't do that. When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When on earth did we see you as a stranger and take you in or, or naked and clothe you? That, that never happened. Um, or when did you see us? Uh, we, did we see you, Jesus, sick or in prison or come to you? Never. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, to the one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And this is, according to Cuneo, biblical proof that one can have non-conscious relations with Jesus, with God himself in the flesh, namely through doing good works for others. By doing good works for others, it's the same as though you're doing good works for God and you're relating to God via relating to other human beings. And even if, so even if you don't believe in God, even if you don't have a conscious relationship that you're doing stuff for God necessarily, um, or, that, or that you're relating to God and that sort of thing, uh, non-consciously, you, you can still be relating to him through doing these good works or having certain experiences of the world and that sort of thing. And this is what Cuneo believes is, is sufficient. God needs only to be open to these kinds of of relationships. If you're a real seeker or a non-resistant non-believer, the non-conscious relationships with God are good enough. That's all God need to be open to, not the conscious variety. Um, so yeah, that's, that's in a nutshell his argument there. Now it must be admitted 
that um, I definitely think that the appeal to the possibility of non-conscious meaningful relationships with God in this life, uh, it, there is some merit to it. Obviously, we've got Bible verses that speak about this kind of thing, right? Uh, as you, you know, the Protestant work ethic, work or, or as slaves, you know, work as though you're working for God. You're not for your master or earthly reasons, but as though your master is God and that sort of thing. And you're working for God by doing stuff. But I think that the response to this is, look, this, this obviously, even Cuneo himself admits that conscious relationships with God are vastly superior and therefore preferable to the non-conscious variety. He, Cuneo is just saying, but the non-conscious relationships, they're vastly inferior, but they're good enough. You know, if you're a real seeker, that's all God needs to do. Um, but I don't think so. I think that's, number one, philosophically objectionable. Because, I mean, God is a greatest possible being, wants to have the best possible type of relationships with us. And also, biblically speaking, it really does seem that the tide of Scripture is favoring conscious personal relationships between God and human and real seekers. And this seems to be the promise that um, when you're really seeking, you're going to get into these relationships, at the very least, before any point of no return or points of no return. Um, and remember the way I, f I, found, I founded them, right? So just the way the Bible speaks of the relationships, being, it seems like to me that it's conscious relationships. I agree with the atheists on this. I don't think that non-conscious relationships are sufficient for real seekers or non-resistant non-believers. God should be or would be open to better than that at that point. Um, however, I don't deny that there could be non-conscious relationship aspects that obtain for real seekers um, and even for non-real seekers perhaps you know atheists and skeptics when they do good um, in a way they're non-consciously relating to God they're reflecting God's image unbeknownst to them and doing these good things um, and that's they're in some kind of non-conscious relationship with God so there is some truth here but it, it's just I don't think that it gets to the, it defeats this premise. I do think if you're a real seeker or a non-resistant non-believer, then God has a duty to be open to conscious relationships. That's philosophically what a real maximally great being would be open to, um, if possible, uh, as much as possible. And if you're a real seeker, it is. Um, but um, uh, unless you have a greater good reason for not being, uh, but that's a different uh, thing altogether. Um, and then biblically speaking, just following the Bible, this is really the thrust of the Bible. This is what we're talking about in terms of personal relationships, repairing the relationships. It, it's, it's, you know, the conditions of being a real seeker or seeking after God, the reward is clearly conscious personal relationships with God. It's, it's insufficient to have a non-conscious relationship. Um, at any given time. So, yeah, that's that's kind of my take. I don't buy the Terence Cuneo argument. I think it's interesting. I do think that there is some partial truth to it and that even when we have our conscious relationship with Jesus, there are also non-conscious relations as proven by this Matthew uh, Matthew text, right? Um, we're, by doing good for others, we don't realize that we're relating to Jesus uh, in that moment or relating to God in that moment. So yeah, that's uh, Cuneo's thing. Look out for his paper. You can read it and see what you think about that. Um, okay, cool. So one final point of clarification on premise number five here. Great. A non-resistant non-believer, or as Dale calls it, a real seeker. What the heck do these terms mean? What does Schellenberg mean by a non-resistant non-believer? What is that? Um, well, uh, here's how Schellenberg himself kind of lays things out. Okay, so in terms of uh, non-resistant non-believers, Schellenberg gives four categories that he thinks qualify. So in the first place, there are former believers, those who used to believe in God, but have now lost or deconverted from their belief in God. 
uh, through no fault of their own. They're not resisting, according to Schellenberg. So this is his first category. The second category are lifelong seekers, those who seek for their entire life, but they never find. They never find anything in their lifetimes. Um, and then uh, the third category is converts to non-theistic religions, so converts to Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, stuff like that. And then finally four, isolated non-theists. Um, so yeah, let, the isolated non-theists, these are people who were never in a position to know or to relate to God in the first place. They'd never even heard of God or, you know, through no fault of their own. Um, and these might be comparable to some people with natural non-resistant non-believers. Um, if you remember the natural non-believers in God from that cognitive science of religion, they might qualify in this category, according to Schellenberg um, and that sort of thing. And, and uh, you can read for yourself, Schellenberg gives certain analogies for these types of people. Now, speaking as a Bible-believing Christian theist, um, there may or may not be some aspects of Schellenberg's definition and his four categories of non-resistant non-believer that are controversial. For example, a lifelong seeker. I don't believe there are any lifelong seekers who never... If you seek God, if you're a, a real seeker and you seek God, non, if you don't resist belief in God, uh, you're going to find God before you... The point of no return, which is presumably uh, death, you know, according to the Bible. So I don't believe that there are non-resistant, uh, lifelong non-resistant non-believers. Um, and there's problems with other categories. Calvinists might deny that there were former believers and stuff like that. So we, there's a lot of debate and controversy in these four categories that Schellenberg is trying to bring up. Um, and this is why I've, ad I've adapted the minimal standard, right? So f I've kept the non-resistant non-believer just to say, look, I'm... I'm paying homage to Schellenberg, but his premise is too strong and too controversial. He can't meet his burden of proof, or it's going to be lower the probability. So this is why I said, or we can go with a more minimal standard, just my standard that I have to agree with, I'm Real Seeker Ministries. If you are a real seeker, then God has to be open to conscious relationships with you. So ultimately, the real standard here is not a non-resistant non-believer, uh, because I think that that contains controversial elements. Really, what we're talking about with premise five is, are you a real seeker or not? So what the heck's a real seeker? Well, I, I have three criteria, basically. There's three criteria for the human being. One, the real seeker must be sincerely open-minded to the truth about God's existence or religious matters. Uh, in this case, does God exist? Secondly, the real seeker must actively seek the truth via seriously considering all sides to the best of their ability. It's relative to your best because some people are smarter than others. They have access to different resources and that sort of thing. So there's an element of individual uh, relativity here in terms of the standard. What is your best? And finally, thirdly, the real seeker must be willing to obey, follow, and or submit to the truth in, and or to God in whatever way is appropriate uh, upon discovery of the truth of God's existence or upon discovery of the tr those religious truths or whatever it is, in this case, that God exists. That's it. If you, that, if you fulfill those, then you're a real seeker. And if you're a real seeker, that's all you need to do. Um, then God must, I argue, God must be open um, to having a conscious, the conscious relationship with you. Now I signed a 100% proven level to the premise as we've stated it in this watered down form, modified and under the notion of at least a real seeker, God needs to be open consciously. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is 100% proven true. Again, the main objection under premise five is the Terence Cuneo argument that no, it's sufficient. God needs only to be open for real seekers. He only needs to be open to non-conscious relationships. I don't think that works. I think that's a failure as an argument, both biblically and philosophically. Um, so yeah, I, I've assigned 100% proven true for this premise. Uh, dang, these atheists are doing phenomenal. So far, every single premise has been 100% proven true. Uh, 
this is not looking good for theists. Um, my goodness, uh, is Schellenberg are, is, are we have we defeated belief in God here? Well, thankfully we still have a few more premises to go through, and hopefully we'll dwindle down the probability. Hopefully some of these premises won't be one hundred percent proven or one hundred percent warranted. So let's move on to premise number six. If God is open to reciprocal, positively meaningful, conscious relationships, bit of a mouthful, uh, with any and all real seekers or non-resistant non-believers, um, then no such person, no real seeker would ever blamelessly fail to consciously believe the proposition that God exists at any and all given times that such relationships are to be actualized, meaning points of no return, unless God had or has a sufficient reason uh, for permitting for permitting that lack of belief, um, and that reason must be consistent morally, theologically, and otherwise consistent with His divine nature. So that's premise number six. And this is basically the premise that says, look, it's necessary. So if, pretend premise five is right. God, you're a real seeker. Then God's got to be open to having a conscious, meaningful relationship, reciprocal relationship with you. Uh, and it's positive. Great, grand, and groovy. How does he accomplish that? Well, this premise says, well, minimally, a necessary criterion to achieve that relationship, you have to believe you have to believe God exists, the proposition God exists. You have to explicitly go in your head, I believe that God exists. That's what this premise is saying. And you have and this would be the case for all real seekers. None of them could blamelessly fail to consciously believe this proposition at any time. That and I've qual so Schellenberg again would say at all times. I've qualified this to water down the premise and make it less controversial by saying at all times that having the relationship is required or need, ought to be uh, actualized. Uh, so that's that's my version of the premise. It's less controversial, slightly less controversial. It's just saying any times where that relationship ought to actualize, at those times, then you must consciously believe the proposition God exists. So that's the modified premise that I've given, whereas someone like Schellenberg would say, yeah, but that's, and that's all times, at any time, T1, T2, T3, you always have to have a relationship, and therefore you always have to have the belief. I'm not making that controversial claim. The way I've stated the premises are less uh, controversial, but they're consistent with uh, J.L. Schellenberg's stronger claims in that regards, and I... I personally think he's right, but I just don't think he needs to argue for that. So I'm going to steel man the atheist argument here. Okay, so let's get into an assessment of premise six. Okay, so premise six, as I said uh, before, is the premise that says uh, belief, conscious, full propositional conscious belief is necessary for having one of these meaningful relationships between human beings, real seekers, and God. And... J.L. Schellenberg has uh, a six-premise argument um, to that effect that he calls the personal, personal relationship argument. Um, I won't go over that, but that's in my chapter when that's available. Um, but essentially, it just gives the basics and in the end, belief is necessary. Now, as we saw uh, with in premise five, we mentioned Terence Cuneo, and he thinks uh, that non-conscious relationships are sufficient and you don't need conscious relationships. But interestingly enough, that Cuneo himself in his own paper does agree that, but if conscious relationships are uh, what God needs to be open to, well then, yeah, uh, premise six is correct. If you're going to have a conscious relationship, then you need conscious belief in God. So Cuneo would agree fully with premise six in the argument here. Um, however, I think we need to ask, well, is it true? Do you need to have a full conscious propositional belief that God exists in order to have a conscious, meaningful relationship with him in the sense specified in premise five? 
Um, well, it, in the first place, it might seem, well, of course. I mean, this is just commonsensical. How can you have a relationship with someone that you don't believe exists in the first place, right? I mean, think of all the atheists and skeptics. Uh, you know, on the internet, they give their fundily atheist response where they say, well, I don't hate God. I, I don't even believe God exists in the first place. So how you can't hate what you don't believe exists. Um, you can't have any kind of relationship with uh, things that don't exist and that sort of thing, things that you don't believe exist. And I, I admit, yeah, at face value, prima facie, this is a pretty compelling case. Um, however, I just want to mention that, well, believe it or not, there have been some philosophers who have challenged this claim, and they say, no, you don't need to have a full propositional conscious belief in order to have a conscious, meaningful relationship of the sort specified in premise five. So believe it or not, there's actually been a couple of papers that have challenged this premise or this notion specifically. And the first that I want to mention is a paper by a couple of philosophers named Ted Poston and Trent Doherty. Um, and this is entitled Divine Hiddenness and the Nature of Belief. In their paper, what they do is they try to distinguish between two types of belief. And they'll say, Look, there is de dicto belief. So de dicto is a fancy philosophical term. It just means, uh, it refers to explicit, fully conscious uh, things you're cognizant of. It's a quote unquote belief that, and then you insert a pro proposition, right? So it's explicit. So this is the kind of thing that J.L. Schellenberg and the atheists have in mind with this premise six, right? They're saying you need this de dicto type belief in order to have a conscious relationship with God. But Doherty and Poston say, well, no, you you don't necessarily need a de dicto belief. It's sufficient to have what they call a de re belief. De re, again, fancy philosophical talk. De re just means, look, it's instead, you don't need a explicit belief that God exists in terms of the proposition. You just need a belief of the thing itself. So that's what de re means, belief of the thing or the the object or something like that. So you can ha you can relate to God by having a belief of God, even if you're not consciously aware that it's about it's a belief that God exists or that God is something or whatever. So yeah, here here's how they define the distinction between the two types of belief in their own words. So quote unquote on page one eighty five. Belief de dicto of the dictum or proposition is the endorsement of some proposition that is preceded by a that clause. Belief that God exists. Belief that it is raining. You know, stuff of that nature. So for instance, S believes that P indicates that S believes P de dicto. Uh, okay, that's confusing. Belief de re is of the res, uh, Latin for the thing. This is belief of a thing or individual that has some feature, even if the de re believer does not recognize the subject under some specific description. So it's a difference between de dicto is an explicit belief, belief that something, but de re is a belief in implicit belief of something. Um, so that's kind of in a, a, a nutshell what the distinction is. And just to help you understand it a little bit more, uh, Poston and Doherty give an excellent example. That's kind of the textbook case distinguishing this type of thing, right? So, quote unquote, for instance, we believe de dicto that Mark Twain is a great author. So let's say there's some guy, he believes de dicto. He has an explicit conscious belief that Mark Twain is a great author. Great. That's the way we understand belief normally. But... Let's say this person doesn't realize that Mark Twain is the same person as Samuel Clemens. So we, in this case, we can't say uh, that uh, this person believes that Samuel Clemens is a great author because he doesn't have that conscious, explicit belief. And in fact, point of fact, he might even explicitly deny his belief that Samuel Clemens is a great author. But nonetheless, since we know he does explicitly claim Mark Twain is a great author, and we know he's ignorant of the fact that Mark Twain is the same as Samuel Clemens, we can say he has a de re belief 
of Samuel Clemens that he is a great author. So that uh, is a great way of uh, kind of illustrating the difference there um, in a nutshell. So great. So how does this apply to the case of uh, belief in God? Um, well, as, as you can see, right? So Doherty and Poston are suggesting, look, maybe atheists and skeptics, uh, they claim they don't have a belief that God exists, uh, but implicitly they have a belief de re of God that he exists in some other implicit way. Um, so that's how it kind of works there, right? And this kind of makes sense with a lot of Calvinists or some, some texts of the Bible, like Romans chapters 1 to 3, uh, may have something like this distinction in mind, right? Um, and some Christians will want to argue, I'm, I'm iffy on it, but some Christians argue that there are no atheists. Everybody really in their deepest heart of hearts really do believe in God. Even if they say, even if they on a conscious level explicitly deny it, and we don't have to ascribe, oh, they're just liars. No, maybe they really have deluded themselves and they don't believe it. But nonetheless... You could say, yeah, but the Bible's saying they do believe, have a belief de re that God exists. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to mention that. So so let's uh, go, move on here with their analysis. Okay, so they go on to try and say, look, in terms of having a de re belief, that is sufficient to have a conscious, meaningful relationship with someone, uh, including God, between a, a real seeker and God, or a non-resistant non-believer and God. And they give this uh, famous thought experiment uh, called the unknown benefactor case. So there's a couple of examples here. So here, quote unquote, first, we present a case where you do not need the de dicto belief, but you are in a meaningful personal relationship. So the first thing is, look, suppose in a moment of need, some extra money shows up in your bank account. You ask the bank if it is a mistake and they say, no, an anonymous donor has wired you the money. You think to yourself, thank you, whoever you are. Now, in this case, you lack de dicto belief. You don't have a belief that uh, John, John A. put money in your bank account. But especially um, if the other person is able to anonymously see your reaction, you know, they're standing nearby or something when you're in the bank, then it is still fair to say that the two of you have a meaningful relationship. You have this de re gratitudinal belief, belief of gratitude towards whoever you are of the person who donated the money to you anonymously. Um, so you have this belief of the person and that's sufficient. You do have this meaningful relationship of appreciation and gratitude for what they did for you. Um, now, uh, Poss and Doherty uh, kind of take the same example and they go even a little bit further to elucidate the point here. And so what they say is, okay, look, once again, assume in a moment of need, some extra money shows up in your bank account. Now you, do, you don't know whether this is a mistake or if someone has given you this money. And for whatever reason, as a slip of mind, you forget to ask. You don't ask the bank teller, is this a mistake or not? So you're in this state of agnosticism. You don't know if someone's donated money. You don't even, or if it was just a random bank error or something like that. So you, but nonetheless, you think to yourself, thank you, whoever you are. So obviously in this case, you have neither de dicto belief, um, nor a very high degree of belief that somebody donated money. In fact, you're 50, 50, you don't know if somebody actually donated money or not yet. You still say, thank you, whoever you are. So you, in that case, once again, the person is standing nearby, he sees your attitude of great gratitude attitude of gratitude uh poet and don't know it but um anyways uh once again uh, according to Poss and Doherty you have this meaningful conscious relationship based on gratitude and appreciation for what the other has done to you even though you you don't even have a de dicto belief that someone donated the money to you you're agnostic as to is this just a random bank error or did someone actually give me some extra money but nonetheless, this is sufficient, according to them, to have a conscious, meaningful relationship. So obviously from these examples, they go on to argue that, well, God is, I mean, God as God is as a real maximum great being. He's the benefactor of everybody, of everything. So uh, whoever expresses gratitude for anything in this life is really expressing gratitude to God, whether they explicitly realize it or not. You know, thank you for having my 
my uh, son or daughter born or something or thank you for letting me have the joy of jet skiing or skydiving or or something like this or oh i i almost died thank you for that or something you're thanking god as your ultimate benefactor unbeknownst to you you don't even know you know you don't have a belief that i'm thanking god or i'm that god did this for me but you have nonetheless god did do it for you you're thankful for it because of that, you have a de re belief in God and de re gratitude towards him. I believe of God that he is uh, worthy of my appreciation for this wonderful thing in my life or something like that. So that's what they say. Look, th this absolutely proves you don't need a de dicto belief uh, in order to have a meaningful relationship with God, according to these authors. Now, just by way of retort, so Schellenberg has written a paper. There's been a couple papers, so I'm going to have Poston Doherty's paper on my blog, as well as two counter-responses. One by Schellenberg, which is a short one, six pages, it's a little weak. Um, but I, I still think he gives some good counters. Uh, and then another one by Benjamin Cordy, Cordry. Um, great paper, one of the best, kind of tackling this. But yeah, by way of retort, look, J.L. Schellenberg in his paper on not necessarily darkening the glass, a reply to Poston and Doherty, uh, he kind of argues that de re belief in God is not sufficient for the specific type of reciprocal, positively meaningful conscious relationships that he's talking about and specifying in his premise. He's saying, okay, sure, you can have some kind of a meaningful conscious relationship but it's still insufficient. It's not of the degree that we would expect from a real maximally great being to be open to. No, for that, it's got to be an explicit relationship. This is what the Bible says. This is what we're looking for. It's, it's got to be a conscious experience. It's got to be personal, intimate, mutual, reciprocal. It's got You've got to be able to give things like worship. And for that, Schellenberg argues, clearly nothing short of genuine belief and belief de dicto will suffice for these kinds of relations. Um, and to some extent, I, I agree with him. As a Bible-believing Christian theist, we, of course we have to. We know that explicit belief at one point or another is, in order to properly worship God, we need belief that God exists and belief that God has done something. That's, that's what the true sufficient conscious relationship is that we're aiming for. So I, I agree with Schellenberg. Um, even if I agree that the de re appreciation belief counts for something it's it's still insufficient in my books and i think schellenberg is right to call this out and say no we would expect more now one thing i would say in my evaluation in terms of needing worship there could be looser senses right i i do think you can be said to be ascribing worth value or appreciating the value of god in a de re capacity. So I don't, I don't, I disagree with Schellenberg that in order to worship, you have to have a de dicto belief in God's existence. I think you can de re worship God in a looser sense, but it's clear that the de re kind of worship is insufficient. The true worship, the true proper sufficient worship, ascribing of worth of, to God does require conscious de dicto belief. So I, I agree with Schellenberg on that, and I, I don't agree with the distinction. Now, additionally, I mentioned Benjamin Cordry. He's also written probably the best paper I've seen on this topic, refuting it, uh, uh, called Divine Hiddenness and Belief de Re. And here he argues, look, philosophically, in the philosophy of language, we know that there is a quote-unquote specific set of conditions based on ascribing belief de re. Uh, and he says, by using these conditions, because we know how and when ascribing some, oh, you have a de re belief. There are four sets of conditions or rules that must be fulfilled before you can ascribe to someone de re belief. And uh, Benjamin Cordry is saying, look, when we apply these four conditions, um, to the Mark Twain example, for, for example, it works perfectly. It, they're fulfilled. When we apply it to God in this case, atheists and God, uh, a lot more questionable, if not it's, according to him, implausible that we can ascribe belief de re to atheists or to real seekers who are atheists and skeptics 
according to him. Um, it, it, or at the very least, it's a lot more questionable. So he says, look, quote unquote, it is prima facie implausible to claim that seemingly inculpable and apparent unbelievers are really de re believers. He goes on to say, while it is indeed possible that a dedicto unbeliever is a de re believer, it is unlikely that it has sufficiently general application to actual individuals to alleviate the problem of divine hidden. So what are these four conditions for ascribing when, when or when not somebody has a de re belief? So the first is the ascriber must hold that there is some mode of presentation between the object or between God and the subject. So the um, object, uh, there's a mode of presentation to the subject, right, of the object itself, in this case, God to the real seeker. The, the ascriber must hold that God or the object has a place within the ontology available to the subject within your general ontology worldview. Three, the ascriber must hold that the attitude, belief, feeling, etc. of the subject is sufficiently specific that it can be legitimately interpreted as aimed at the object, such as God. Finally, four, the ascriber must be able to explain away de dicto defeaters as well. So, you know, things that the subject explicitly says or explicitly believes that if these count as defeaters to a sufficient degree to overweigh the deray belief, then we can't ascribe a deray belief in God. So those are the four conditions, right? I mean, remember, we he's got a de dicto belief. Maybe some atheists and skeptics who are real seekers have a de dicto belief that God does not exist. Maybe these are so sufficiently strong that they overwhelm your de re belief that God exists. So in that case, we can't say, yeah, but you really believe in God. No, they don't. All things considered de re and de dicto beliefs, the, the uh, preponderance of evidence favors disbelief in God. So that's what the fourth condition is. Um, so he goes on to describe, as you're seeing up on your YouTube screens here, I've created a kind of a comparison chart, right? So we've got these four conditions. How does the Mark Twain example, remember, he's got a de dicto belief that Mark Twain is a great author, but a de re belief that Samuel Clemens is a great author. And then belief in God, uh, someone, an atheist or a real seeker, atheist or skeptic, who ha lacks de dicto belief that God exists, but has a de re belief that God exists. So the first criterion is the mode of presentation. How does uh, the Mark Twain example stack up? Well, obviously, Samuel Clemens is present. He, the, sub, the object presents itself in the form of Mark Twain to this person uh, who's called Tom in the example. So obviously Samuel Clemens is, unbeknownst to Tom in an explicit way, he's present to, to Tom in the form of Mark Twain. In the case of athe uh, real seeking atheists and skeptics, well, in order to make uh, this description, the scriber must hold that the unbelieving atheist really does have a mode of presentation of God present to him. And further, that this presentation is actually involved in certain attitudes or beliefs that are directed at God. Um, now, he said, uh, Cordroy argues, but this is far from obvious. It's, it's very questionable that all non-resistant non-believers or all real seekers uh, who are atheists and skeptics would meet this condition. So this is questionable or problematic, according to Cordroy. Secondly, okay, the God must fit into the ontology. Well, in the Mark Twain example, uh, Samuel Clemens is a person. Uh, and Tom makes frequent use of this ontological category. So, yes, uh, it's it's fully within his prior ontological commitments and presuppositions that Samuel Clemens is a human being and there are persons and Samuel Clemens is a person. Great, grand, and groovy. Fulfilled. Unfortunately, in terms of the ontology with respect to God belief, there's a problem when ascribing belief to the ignorant Right? Remember the Schellenberg's different categories. Maybe there's people that have never heard the isolated unbeliever, as Schellenberg calls it. Well, if the ignorant don't even have an idea about God, or even the resources needed to readily construct an idea about God, well, then obviously one can't ascribe a God directed belief or attitude de re to them. Right? It's, it's just totally absent from their ontology. 
So because of that, it failed. This is saying that saying that these people have a de re belief fails, at least in the case of isolated unbelievers who've never heard of Jesus or never even heard of the Western concept of God or as a real maximally great being or as God in general and that sort of thing. So I think that one's kind of, uh, there may be some uh, debate there. Obviously people will say, yeah, but God is present to every single person or no one's isolated. God always provides a census divinitatis induced properly basic belief to people. But again, I'm just saying this is what Cordray says. He says it fails for that reason. Finally, with specificity, it's got to be specifically aimed at God, God belief, right? Okay, so with the Mark Twain example, in terms of specificity, well, Samuel Clemens and Mark Twain designate identical people in reality. So obviously the belief de re is directed, specifically directed at Samuel Clemens here. Now, in the case of uh, God, once again, in the case of uh, the ignorant or isolated unbeliever, Cordray argues that this condition is not fulfilled either because God is, uh, even supposing God's a thing, then God has a place in everyone and God has a place in everyone's ontology. Nonetheless, if God fits into a person's ontology in only a very general way, then one goes well beyond what is warranted when ascribing to the ignorant person beliefs or attitudes de re that are specifically directed towards God. Again, Cordray is saying you would lack specificity here. Even even if you ascribe, maybe through the sense system and the tautus, they have this general idea of God that's not specific enough, according to Cordra, or he's questioning whether that is specific enough to qualify as having a de re belief of God. It's not enough to just have a loose sense. And he gives an example in his paper about the Nile or something like that. So uh, read that. But finally, um, there can't be any de dicto defeaters. Well, in the case of the Mark Twain example, uh, look, he has no reasons no reasons at all to think that Samuel Clemens is not a great author uh, in terms of de dicto beliefs or something. So there are no defeaters present uh, for him in this case to defeat his de re belief that Samuel Clemens is a great author. What about this condition in terms of God belief, de re? Well, this is particularly a problem for, uh, for critics of religion, people who claim to be uh, atheists or agnostics and skeptics, and they're real seekers, and they know the arguments and that sort of thing. Well, you, how can you ascribe a belief de re when they de dicto? They know the arguments and defeaters, and they say, no, look, these defeaters de dicto overcome any implicit de re belief that I'm not fully conscious of or don't really uh, explicitly state and that sort of thing. So how do we make sense of that then? It doesn't seem to fit. So on this basis... Uh, Cordray argues that fails God belief de re fails all four of these criteria. Therefore, we cannot ascribe to any and all atheist real seekers that they do in fact have de re belief in God. And if they're lacking de re belief in God, then uh, then that fails uh, according to um, uh, Poston and Doherty, right? Because they're trying to say, yeah, they don't have a de dicto belief, but at least God would give them a de re belief. And uh, Cordray's arguing here, no, they don't. we can't even prove or ascribe to them a de re belief. So they even fail on that basis. So that's the point of what we've been going over here. A little bit skeptical of this de re versus de dicto um, claim. I, I'm skeptical that even, even if we do ascribe a de re belief, because I think we can challenge some of Cordray's arguments and stuff, especially from a Bible-believing Christian perspective, we can deny, no, we, we know that they do have a de re belief or something like that, or that in terms of some of the conditions, those, it can be argued that they are fulfilled. It's not as problematic as Cordray is making it sound, or at least it's not provable that they fail, like Cordray argued. What I question is, look, even if we do ascribe de re's beliefs, is that sufficient for this proper conscious relationship? Wouldn't they need a de dicto belief? And I, I tend to be of the persuasion that I do think that obviously a de dicto belief, everyone admits that's superior for having a conscious relationship. That's preferable over a de re belief in God. Although admittedly in their paper, Poston and Doherty do try to argue that there are certain goods that only arise with de re belief. And 
actually, so they would disagree with me. They, they do try to attempt to argue in their paper, I think unsuccessfully, that, oh, well, de re belief is prefer might even be preferable to de dicto belief, at least at some times or at certain times in people's lives because there are only certain goods like uh, from seeking God or something like that or, or certain goods that can only come about when you have de re belief and don't come about if you have de dicto belief. Um, but I think overall, all things considered, it's pretty clear that de dicto belief is where it's at. Uh, that's what we're looking for. So I disagree with, with that. Um, I think it's always preferable and better. Um, all else being equal, it's, it's all... Uh, it's always better to have de dicto over and against de re, de re belief. But I think that given what the Bible says, I think based on philosophical grounds as God is a real maximally great being, again, we want to go for it. There needs to be at least some kind of explicit de dicto component that's present and people are cognizant of in order to have that properly conscious, meaningful relationship so i i disagree with Poston and doherty i i don't think that a de re belief in god is sufficient for a conscious reciprocal conscious positively meaningful relationship with god and and what we're looking for what schellenberg and what the atheists and what is logically entailed in having god as a real maximally great being we would expect it there there has to be some element of de dicto explicit belief that God exists. So I agree with the atheists and the skeptics on this front. However, believe it or not, there's another challenge. And this is brought up both by Poston and Doherty, but another author, Andrew Cullison. Um, and I'll get into them in a moment. But they provide examples of saying, okay, maybe belief de dicto must be present to some, uh, in some form, at least partially. However, there's a difference between partial beliefs versus full beliefs. And it may be that belief itself, as Cullison argues, as we'll see, uh, it may even be that partial de dicto belief isn't necessary, but it hope uh, for belief de dicto is, is uh, sorry, belief de dicto plus hope is sufficient. Um, so yeah, we're, we're going to look into this. So can you, is it sufficient to have just a partial de dicto belief in God? Or is it sufficient to have a partial de dicto belief plus hope, uh, as Cullison argues, as we'll see in a second? These conditions are sufficient. You don't need what Schellenberg and the atheists claim, a full 100% degree knowledge, belief de dicto that God exists, that you're fully conscious of, uh, and that sort of thing. So, so how do they argue for that on this front here? Okay, so starting with Poston and Doherty in their paper, um, again, all for free on my blog for you guys, if you want to uh, research further. But yeah, they, they make this distinction between full and partial propositional belief. And they say, well, look, a partial conscious propositional belief is sufficient for a meaningful conscious relationship. You don't have to have a 100% degree of justification or warrant or confidence in your belief that God exists in order to have this meaningful relationship with them. That's complete rubbish. And that's an absolutely proven fact. I, I think everyone with a functioning brain would agree with this. I myself uh, came to believe I was 99% uh, degree of warrant that God exists. That's sufficient. Anything on a balance of probabilities is sufficient to have a, to believe that God exists. That's the sufficiency threshold, right? You you uh, apportion your beliefs on the basis of the evidence on a balance uh, of probabilities or on the preponderance of evidence, as lawyers like to say. Uh, this is the proper way to do it. That 50% line is the sufficiency threshold. 49% to 0%, you disbelieve. 50-50, you're agnostic. You don't believe or disbelieve. You suspend judgment, is how philosophers say it. 51% to 100%, you believe the proposition. That's the proper way to be. So yeah, if you've got 51% or more, or you know over 50%, whatever that is, doesn't matter, 50.01 or whatever, you believe that God exists, but you apportion your belief accordingly because, the, yeah, there's room for doubt and stuff. You don't have to have 100% degree of knowledge. And this is obvious as Bible-believing Christians. I mean, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. You're allowed to have doubts. You're allowed to have... You don't have to have 100% degree of knowledge or warrant that God exists 
in order to have a meaningful conscious relationship with them. I would, though, say that, yeah, that is better. And I believe that that's what we're heading. After this life in judgment, we will all have 100% degree of knowledge that God exists and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that will be a fullest or fuller because uh, we're going to complete, never uh, finish with God over eternity. We're going to always grow and learn more and more, know more and more about God and stuff over eternity. It's going to be wonderful and amazing. He, he's potentially infinite with his riches and wonders and uh, things that we're going to learn about him uh, and develop our relationships and stuff like that. It's never going to be static. We're never going to know all there is about God. But nonetheless, we will have, at the very at certain propositions, we will have the 100% degree of knowledge. And that will, especially that God exists, and that will, uh, ooh, that will be enrich our relationships. It's better to have a 100% degree of knowledge than a 99% or 51% or something like that, obviously. But the 51% is clearly sufficient to believe in God and to have a conscious relationship. God in this sinful world, we are is able to have a sufficiently meaningful conscious relationship with us um, with 51% or more. Uh, and that's what uh, these guys are arguing and they provide examples to that. Now, one thing that I disagree with, um, but uh, well, okay, let me give their example first before I get into this. So how do they prove this? What thought experiment do they give? And they provide uh, the example of the tap thought exper tapping thought experiment or the prison tapping thought experiment it's known as in the literature. So, quote unquote, suppose that George Jones, an unfortunate fellow, is locked in solitary confinement um, in a dark prison cell. So sorry, in the literature, this is called the tapping case. Uh, you'll see thought experiment. Jones hears... Uh, some faint taps. So Jones is in jail. He's in solitary confinement. Nobody else around. Nobody to talk to. Now, all of a sudden, Jones hears some faint taps coming from the other side of his prison wall. The taps seem to resemble the presence of another person willing to communicate. But he's not at all certain that there is another person in the other cell. He has no idea. Yet Jones begins to tap back. The tapping resembles intelligent design to him. So he's, he's saying, well, if the tapping is real, there's got to be an intelligent agent here. Uh, it's not just random taps. So yeah, let's suppose that this activity continues over a long period of time and Jones can, with some effort, make sense of the taps as another person attempting to communicate with him. And so he communicates back and forth over months. Now let's suppose that Jones's credence that his degree of belief or rational confidence or warrant in terms of his claim that there is another person that he's communicating with, he's agnostic. It's 0.5, 50% or 50-50. So it's less than that 51%. It's less than that sufficiency threshold to believe uh, that the proposition is true. Now let's say that um, after some time he gets released and then after some time about a year later, he encounters Smith and find, oh, hey, how are you doing? And, oh, yeah, I was in jail. Oh, I was in the same jail. Yeah, I was put in solitary confinement cell B2. Uh, hey, I was in solitary confinement B1. Uh, w did you hear tapping? It's like, yeah, some guy was from B1 was tapping. That was me. So that was you tapping to me. And they realize, hey, we actually had a real relationship, a real conscious, meaningful relationship, despite the fact that he had a partial degree partial to the sense where he was agnostic he, he should have suspended judgment he actually suspended judgment as to whether there was somebody to actually tapping back in b2 nonetheless he still had this meaning smith and jones had this meaningful conscious relationship um despite their lack of belief and obviously with these they they argue so here's the part that i am skeptical about or disagree with uh, at least partially, they say, and this works for even if you should disbelieve there's a person, right? So if you have less than 50% degree of confidence or warrant that somebody else, that Smith was in cell B2 tapping to you, uh, you can still have a meaningful relationship to you. And this gets into, okay, uh, Pascal's wager, you know, like at what level with respect to God, what is that sufficiency threshold you know, what degree of belief is sufficient 
to have these meaningful conscious relationships. Is 10% degree of confidence sufficient? 1%, 20%, what, what is it? And I, what um, Pawson and Doherty argue is that, look, it, it's obvious that for very low degrees of belief, this tapping case proves that you would uh, definitely 10% or even uh, 1% would be sufficient if you're just 1% confident that there really is another person on the other side of that wall. And then you find out after the fact there was that other person, we would still say, yeah, you, you had a meaningful conscious relationship according to them. Um, now, obviously, the atheist gambit is to say, well, well, that's not good enough. I'm, we're talking about atheists, real seeking atheists or non-resistant, non-believing atheists um, that have 0.01% degree of confidence that God is, exists, that there is that other guy in B2, that, you know, there is God, that God exists kind of thing. Uh, and and those that's an insufficient thing. So sure, you can point to cases where people have 1% belief and that's good enough, according to your tapping case. But there are people that only have 0.01% uh, degree of belief in that God exists, and that's insufficient to have a conscious relationship. Well, where where is the cutoff line? It's it's obvious the atheist is just being ad hoc and totally arbitrary. He's desperately trying to avoid the obvious truth if he's playing that game. Uh, so that's that's how Poston and Doherty respond to that kind of thing. Um, now, as I said, I, I myself. I'm skeptical about this. I, I honestly think if the evidence suggests that you disbelieve, you should disbelieve the proposition. I think that that hinders you from having a, a it's insufficient. You cannot have a meaningful conscious relationship because you're saying, I don't believe you exist. I, you, you don't exist. You're just a, with the tapping. This is just a hallucination. You, you're not engaging, not even in the hopes, I do think that their case potentially works with the agnostic range. You know, when it's 50 50, um, there seems to be some truth to this tapping case that they are having a meaningful relationship. And I think that uh, that's kind of shocked me and changed my mind because I was a rigorous uniqueness thesis guy, a Richard Feldmanite. Uh, you know, we teach in critical thinking class. No, nope, 50, more than 50%, you believe the proposition and, and therefore you're having a meaningful thing. Uh, so if you're not, if you're in the agnostic range, 50, 50, that, that doesn't mean you're, you don't believe. So you're not having a meaningful conscious relationship. I think they've managed to turn me around, at least in the agnostic range. I think it is possible to have a conscious relationship in this tapping case. Even if you don't know, even if you're agnostic, is there someone there? Am I just hallucinating these taps? I don't know. Um, nonetheless, I continue to do it, do it for months. And then I find out one year later, Smith, you were real. You weren't a hallucination. Yeah, that's confirmation. Yeah, they, they did have a actual relationship. And that would be the same even if you never find out that Smith was actually there. They were having a relationship. They were both real, unbeknownst to them. And they were having this relationship. So that's my take on that. However, I I think that with the case of 50-50, the reason for that is because it's not just the partial belief. Um, you know, partial belief on a balance of probabilities is sufficient to have a conscious relationship. But if it's 50-50 uh, within the agnostic uh, range... Or in the disbelief range, partial belief is not good enough on its own. There needs to also be the hope uh, that the per the there there is that other person and that they exist. So the hope plus a partial belief that's uh, not on a balance proven on a balance of probabilities that might be sufficient for a meaningful conscious relationship with God, and that's what Andrew Cullison argues in his great 2010 paper. That again, I'll be linking to on my blog for free. Uh, so go ahead and read it. His paper is great. So he he argues and he gives his own kind of thought experiment here about loving, meaningful personal relationships that obtain between two or more people who uh, don't believe that the other person exists. They are, they're agnostic and or they even have reason to disbelieve on a balance. Pro they think it's improbable that the other person exists. When that is combined with hope for the other person who exists, 
then that is sufficient for having a meaningful conscious relationship. So what does Cullison argue here? He gives his first, a couple thought experiments. So the first one is called the Turing chat room experiment, right? So picture a grieving man named Bob and a grieving woman named Julie. Both of them join a chat room online one day and they meet each other and you know they start talking and hey this is uh, great i really like you uh, oh i really like you too uh so they talk for a couple months and they're having this great relationship online they never see each other they never do live chats and stuff this is before the days of that uh and then one day bob's buddy benny comes up to him and uh benny says uh, hey you just haven't you've never met this person before you do know you've heard of the turing um test and stuff uh, you're just talking to a computer. It's an artificial intelligence. It, there is no real person there that you're relating to. Uh, we have that capability now. And Bob's, huh? Uh, so this shocks him. And uh, he's like, yeah, you're right. I, I don't know if she's real. So he loses his belief that this person is real on a balance of probabilities. For all he knows, he's agnostic that this may be an AI. And let's say he tr goes to Julia. I, look, I need proof that you're real. I need... You to send me pictures or let's do a live chat and oh, no no i'm shy I, I don't i don't do that or i don't want to do that uh certainly i've had people call me an ai because i don't show my my mush on um on my shows right uh so maybe i'm just an ai you don't know uh, <laughs> uh so let's pretend that, so this gives bob reason to even disbelieve i i think it's improbable you probably are an ai you're probably not real nonetheless in the hope that she is real, Bob continues the re online relationship and he continues acting as though he believes that she's real uh, in the hope that she is because it's such a great relationship. Uh, so they do so for about a year or so. And then afterwards, they finally, they get to the point, it's like, hey, I want to marry you. So I, I need to meet you. And they Julie finally comes around and says, okay, I'm, I'm willing to meet you. They meet. Uh, they get along great, and then uh, another year later, they finally get married and, and tie the knot. Well, of, of course, we would say, even during the time when Bob was agnostic and disbelieved, he thought, it was, he thought he was probably communicating with an AI, an artificial intelligence, uh, but he had a partial belief, dedicto belief that she was real, and the hope that she was real, that is what said, yeah, you had a meaningful relationship. Um, even during the time when you disbelieved, you were still having a real, conscious, meaningful relationship between the two of you. And that's been proven in the fact that you're now married, you've met each other in person, and you're having a, a grand old time. So that's what Andrew Cullison's uh, first thought experiment uh, gives here. And then he gives another thought experiment too, uh, ones that aren't um, that kind of illustrates the same thing. And he calls this the hallucination scenario. So it's the same peeps. So let's suppose that Bob awakens in the hospital to find out that he has a condition that causes him to hallucinate several people who he had previously enjoyed complex and loving personal relationships with. So it's been proven beyond all reasonable doubt to him. These guys were all just hallucinations. Um, now, Bob really likes his, his doctor, Julie, and she informs him that he's now been cured of this ailment, so he will no longer hallucinate ever again. However, Bob doesn't believe her. He, he doesn't just suspend judgment. He actually actively disbelieves her and says, no, I think that you are a hallucination. You telling me that I'm not going to hallucinate, I've been cured, that's all just in my head, it's all just the hallucination. I disbelieve you. I don't think you exist. Now, despite his doubts on this front, he doesn't want to blow to blow uh, this because he really likes Julie as his doctor. So he wants a relationship with her. He hopes that she is real. So on this basis, he decides to treat her as if she's not just a hallucination, even though he believes that's all she is, and he pursues his relationship. Once again, all of the essential elements are present for having a loving, meaningful, conscious, personal relationship, despite the lack of belief on Bob's part. Um, so yeah, Cullison believes, look, these counterexamples, obviously we would say, yeah, um, 
they had a they're having a real meaningful relationship despite the lack of belief on Bob's part that Julie exists. Um, so yeah, obviously Collison believes these counterexamples are superior yet affirming of attempts um, to reject Schellenberg's argument by others like Poston and Doherty. Uh, he thinks that his examples improve upon some of the flaws about the de dicto de re distinction arguments by Poston and Doherty. Um, but yeah, it's, it's obviously, what is, what is it that's showing, what is the essential agreements? Well, it's, it's not belief on a balance of probabilities. Um, obviously there needs to be some component of belief, I think, de dicto. You know, if you have a 0% probability or degree of warrant, it's 0% possible that this person exists. You can't have a relationship with it. So it can't just be hope. I disagree with Collison on that. There has to be at least like a 0.01%. There has to be some degree of belief that you might that you exist, uh, even if it's 0.01%. That plus hope, the hope that you are real, Cullison, uh, and Cullison's argument would say, his thought experiments would seem to suggest that's enough. That's enough for you to have a great relationship. And I think that there is some truth to this argument. I think... Think back uh, when I was agnostic myself, 50-50, uh, and or even if I had some measure of disbelief, say I'm 30% probable that God exists, I think that could be sufficient to have some measure of conscious relationship. It wouldn't be as good as what I had now, but I think for six months of my life, when I, when I was agnostic, um, I still think I had some kind of meaningful conscious relationship with God. Um, even though I could, couldn't affirm the proposition, I believe that God exists at that time. Um, I really did believe in a day ray sense, and I really did have some partial degree of belief and that hope that God exists and that I do feel I had a relationship. So obviously I, I agree that this is sufficient for some kind of meaningful conscious relationship. Now, is it sufficient for the type of relationship as specified in premise five? That's the ultimate question that we need to deal with. And just before we get to that, obviously, uh, Cullison himself addresses some objections in this paper along these lines, right? So I'll, I'll leave it to you guys to read through that when you read the paper, read his paper on my blog or or my uh, write-up, uh, Hiddenness of God chapter, write up on it. Um, I'm not going to go into it here now. He, interestingly, he also provides a secondary argument as well based on self-sacrifice and forgiveness and that sort of thing. Uh, so you might want to read that. I'm not going to cover it here. It, suffice to say, for our purposes here, I just wanted to focus on the first argument relevant to as relevant to premise six. What's my assessment of this? So I, 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 I feel some measure of truth is behind Andrew Cullison's insights insights on this front and same with Doherty and, and Poston um, I think that you can have meaningful personal relationships uh, with God even when you disbelieve he exists and that sort of thing if, as long as you have that hope that he exists as well um, so there are valid insights here but I would agree with the atheist I, I think it's insufficient um, to qualify as having a conscious personal relationship of the kind specified in premise five, the kind that we would expect from a real Max Miller great being, he would be open to the better kind of relationships. And that better kind of relationship does very probably uh, require uh, at least belief on a balance of probabilities, 51% or more degree of belief in God. That's what I think the biblical position is. That's what I think philosophically makes the most sense. But I will say this, that uh, Cullison's arguments and Poston's arguments uh, have given me reasonable doubt as to the truth about the necessity of belief on a balance of probabilities being required for the purpose of facilitating relationships as specified by premise five. I do think it's possible that even without that belief, given their argumentation and thought experience, maybe it's 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 plausible to me that, uh, meaning there's a five percent probability or more that um, 
you could have the conscious relationship specified in premise five, even if you lack belief in God, that God exists on a de dicto, on a balance of probabilities. Um, so congratulations. Uh, on this front, uh, we will assign a 95% proven level, not a 100%. Yay. You know, so you mult for premise six, it's only 95% proven. And I got to specify, that's me speaking as a Bible-believing Christian theist, because there's not only secular warrant, I believe there's also biblical warrant suggesting that um, explicit de dicto belief on a balance of probabilities is required. You have to actually believe in God to have these conscious beliefs. And epistem epistemologically speaking, I believe the sufficiency threshold is during the, you know, with the Lockean thesis, and that is more than 50% to believe. You don't believe before that. So I think that if you disbelieve, uh, you can't have a meaningful relationship to this to the degree that we're talking about, that God should be open to, the type of relationship specified in premise five. And um, I'm 95% convinced based on the secular and biblical warrant combined. But... Remember, the atheist, this is the atheist claim. The atheist bears the burden of proof here. And so you can't assume you're talking to a Bible-believing Christian theist. Obviously, that's, I'm including biblical evidence and biblical warrant because I am a Christian and I want to give a Christian response as best, Bible-believing evangelical Christian response as best as I possibly can. Um, but it's important to note that, look, even, even if the Bible does say it uh, 100%, right? The, I don't think that the Bible is 100% clear. Again, I, I have reasonable doubts. Does the Bible actually teach this? I think it very probably does, but I do have reasonable doubts. Maybe maybe uh, the, it, it is consist, the Bible is consistent with what Cullison and um, Pawson and Doherty are saying here uh, to have these conscious relationships with God. Um, but I think it's very, very, very improbable. But yeah, for, for example, we, we know in the Bible there are cases, oh, you're on holy ground or we can't see God face to face because he's so holy. And because on earth, at least, we're in this sinful, we still struggle against the flesh. We still have our sinful nature. Maybe there has to be some kind of degree of separation uh, in terms of our degree of belief or type of belief or... Uh, in terms of our relationship with God, uh, there has, at, at least until we go to heaven or we, the moment we die and are judged and therefore saved, uh, or sorry, um, the moment we're dead and then resurrected or something, something happens to us. Okay, now we can see God face to face. We're totally made righteous. We're totally sanctified. But it, at least in this life, um, it may be because we're never fully sanctified. We're in the process of sanctification. There has to be at least some degree of separation. And maybe that's, I can see that as being possible or plausible as a biblical perspective saying that, yeah, there, God, even though he's a real maximum great being, he's limited. He can't have the f better kind of conscious relationship that requires the full conscious belief on a balance of probabilities de dicto. Uh, he it's sufficient for him just to be open to the other lesser types of conscious relationships, but still still meaningful as it proven by Collison's thought experiments and, and Doherty's thought experiments and stuff like that. Um, so they're still meaningful and, and that's sufficient. That's the best we can do in this life. Um, because of our sinful nature, God has to be closed to the higher type of relationship until we die, until after judgment, until we're fully sanctified or, or we're, to, we're developed to a state where we can have that type of relationship. So we're not capable of it. Um, maybe something like that I, I can see as being, um, being an argument or something like that. So that's what I would, that's why I have a little bit of doubts here in terms of what the Bible says, but I think it's fairly clear that uh, the Bible is saying, no, we are capable, even in this life, we are capable of the higher level of conscious relationship that J.L. Schellenberg has in mind. Uh, it's very, very, very improbable that God would be closed to those higher levels of relationships. And in fact, we know for a fact, uh, look, the people do. I, I myself, as a Christian now, 
do have that higher level of conscious relationship with God in the here and now. Um, so yeah, I, I, it doesn't even it doesn't even uh, work biblically speaking there because we know for a fact that um, yeah, there, there is no reason why God should be closed to the higher types of relationships when they obtain in the world. Uh, so sorry, I'm I'm thinking this on the spot, and this kind of changes uh, changes things. I need to re rethink that. Um, for now, I'll just say, look, I have I have some reasonable doubt um, that God must be open in all cases with all real seekers in varying states of sanctification. He's got to be open to the higher level of conscious relationship. Um, it's obviously not universal because I myself experienced this higher level of conscious relationship with God in the here and now. I'm not dead as far as I know. Um, I might be an artificial intelligence, but I'm not dead. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I'll say. I, I'm firm here. I have reasonable doubts. I'm only 95% confident that according to the Bible, um, God must be open to the higher level of really conscious relationships with any and all real seekers or any and all non-resistant non-believers. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my take on that front. And, uh, let's finish off. That said, just speaking as not a Bible believing Christian theist, let's take the Bible warrant out. I still think that this on secular philosophical grounds, Cullison and um, Doherty and that have provided a uh, pretty good reason for doubt. Uh, again, on a balance of probabilities, I think that Schellenberg's arguments, counter arguments and that sort of thing, and, and talking about the relationship and the nature of God as a real maximally great being, um, it's very probable that no, we, these are not, these uh, lesser types of beliefs are, and hope is not sufficient. You need belief de dicto that God exists on a balance of probabilities. And if that's the standard, then, um, I'm about 85% convinced on secular grounds only that this premise is true. So the atheist has met his burden of proof, but only in the 85% degree on secular grounds. If you throw in biblical evidence, then I'm 95% convinced that this premise is premise number six is true uh, in the case of the atheist. So I've got 5% doubts overall um, that this premise might be false based on the reasoning and, and trying to say that belief de dicto on a balance of probabilities is uh, not necessary. I, I think that's 5% possible if that makes sense. So Great. Uh, so that's our first premise that fails to reach the 100% proven level. This is at most 95% proven level for Bible-believing Christians. And if you're not a Bible-believing Christian, then I think it's about 85% proven that this premise is true. Uh, so that's my take on that. Um, great. So with that said, let's move on to premise number seven in that case. And premise number seven is basically a sub-conclusion number three. It says, therefore, if from premises five and six, if God exists and is perfectly loving in the way we specified to the maximal calm possible degree, then minimally no non-resistant non-believer or real seeker would ever blamelessly fail to consciously believe propositionally, you know, de dicto on a balance of probabilities that God exists at any given time unless God had sufficient reason for permitting it that's consistent with his divine nature. And this inference, this is a sub-conclusion. It follows via hypothetical syllogism, that valid deductive pattern. So it's 100% proven true. If premises five and six are true, premise seven is guaranteed to be true. It's a valid logical inference. Um, so yeah, 100% on premise number seven. So that's it for today. Um, that's all uh, we're going to talk about in part one of this show on Divine Hiddenness. Next time in part two, we're going to do the finale. We're going to start off with premise eight, right? So premise seven represents our incompatibility premise. All the first seven premises lead up to our incompatibility premise here. Premise eight is the empirical or evidential premise. We're going to be assessing 
well, are there real seekers that qualify, that lack belief or uh, in the specified ways in premise seven? And that's going to establish, okay, well, if there are in fact people like this, then that establishes the fact that there is in fact an incompatibility between this fact and the concept of God as we've established in premises one through four. Um, therefore, that God does not exist. So yeah, we're going to look up into premise eight. And obviously, uh, that's our objections to premise eight. This is where the majority of uh, philosophers uh, try to reject the premise. They'll say things like, oh, well, there are no such people. Or, well, there wouldn't he wouldn't reveal himself at all, t- any and all times. Or they would deny and say, yeah, but God does have a sufficient reason for not revealing himself or not being open to these types of relationships at all times or something like that. And you get a whole host of objections, uh, most of which will be are, would be familiar if you're involved in debates between atheists and Christians on the divine hiddenness argument. But I'll provide a little bit more scholarly detail and my sources in part two there when we finish up. For now, that's it for part one. Um, we've established up to premise seven, the incompatibility premise. You know, if God exists as, we, as we've specified in premises one through four, um, and this feature occur, this non-belief aspect as we've defined it in the other premises does occur, that's incompatible. So we've at least established if there are two, if there are these two facts, then they're incompatible. Next time in part two, okay, but are though those are those two facts facts? Are they real? Are they true? That's what premises eight through ten will establish. Um, okay, great. So, uh, sorry, premise that. Uh, sorry, we have the fact through premises one to four. We have the fact of what God is, and through the other premises up to premise seven, we know what God is. We know He's incompatible with a certain type of non-belief. Premise eight will be saying. Great. The empirical premise. Is it a fact that this kind of non-belief exists uh, and therefore proves the incompatibility is real? Uh, So that's what we'll be doing next time. Uh, I've been talking way too long, so I'm going to shut up. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, Check out my blog again, realseekerministries.wordpress.com, and I'll be posting all of the papers uh, up until premise seven that are relevant to up until premise seven for you guys. I will not be posting my write-up because I want to do modifications and I want to post that as a whole. But once I post up part two, I will have that, uh, the entire, my entire write-up on the hiddenness of God argument freely available for you guys on my blo- both blogs, part one and part two. Uh, so you can read that, um, read that for yourself uh, as well. I'll be posting up uh, the other sources that are relevant to the material in part two, our objections to premise eight, nine, and 10. Um, so yeah, look forward to that. Next week, uh, for you Shroud Wars fans, another Shroud Wars show, uh, at least it's been agreed in principle. Dr. Caesar, no, it's been agreed in detail. Caesar Barda, who's written a new book on the Sudarium of Oviedo, has agreed to come on my show. We're going to be recording July 6th, uh, so I'll have that posted on the weekend of that week. Um all the evidence on the Sudarium of Oviedo. And he's he speaks Spanish. He's not an English speaker. So unfortunately, I couldn't do a discussion or debate with Hugh Ferry. But Hugh Ferry has written on his blog, which I'll include a link to uh, on that show. He's written a review of Caesar's book on the Sudarium. So he's, one, he's probably the world's expert on the sud- evidence from the Sudarium of Oviedo. Hugh Ferry has a lot of respect for him. He's going to be sharing with us the evidence on this front and where it stands. Can we prove that the Sudarium of Oviedo uh, is linked to the Shroud of Turin uh, in any way and that sort of thing? What's the history of it? Uh, what did the bloodstains prove? Did it cover a real corpse? Uh, what about the carbon-14 dating? Um, you know, all that good stuff. So, so look out for that uh, the Saturday after July 6th. Uh, and then I'll have part two of The Hiddenness of God posted. Uh, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Uh, So yeah, uh, have a great one, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay, so we're not done, apparently. Just one little update on premise number six. My assessment at the end was totally wrong-headed. I was talking about the Bible and, oh, we're not sanctified, so this is why God has to be closed. And I said I had reasonable doubts. 
So I've rethought this and rethought what it means. Look, premise five is just saying God has to be open. Remember, open just means in a passive sense. He doesn't prevent or he doesn't allow things to prevent people who are capable of coming into those relationships and who are real seekers from doing so. Uh, he doesn't. Act, it's not saying he has to actively do stuff necessarily or whatever to foster those relationships. And I was confusing real seeker with a non-resistant non-believer. And this is uh, probably why it was a good thing for me to include both definitions. Because, okay, real seekers doesn't have any criteria or talking about someone being capable of entering into a higher conscious relationship with God. Whereas the non-resistant non-believer criteria, Schellenberg does say that they are capable of this higher level relationship. And I think that it's obviously speaking, Bible-believing Christians are in these higher level conscious relationships in the here and now. I mean, look, I'm not dead, for example, as I, as I said, so I'm still here ha and I'm having this higher relationship with God. So that is possible. Therefore, I would expect the higher level dedicto belief on a balance of probabilities to obtain, uh, which it does in my case, and I have this higher relationship. Um, so I don't think that uh, we can say that God would should be closed to any real seekers or any non-resistant non-believers or any capable real seekers. Maybe I should change the premise to say capable real seekers from having these higher relationships. No, it's 100% proven true that God, as a real maximum great being, would be open in the passive watered down sense as we've defined it to having these higher level relationships. It makes no sense. I can think of no reason why God would be closed to the having those higher level relationships and settle for these lesser relationships that Cullison and Poston and Doherty speak about where they have these lesser degrees of belief and lesser levels of relationships and that sort of thing and that's where you get into the debates where well is it, are there goods that only come about from those lesser types of relationships and they try to argue that there are um but again, overall, I think that it's clear that the higher level relationship is the one uh, that has the higher level of belief, degree of belief, uh, at the very least on a balance of probabilities. Um, so yeah, if you're capable of if you're capable of that higher level of belief relationship and belief, uh, then yeah, God would give you that, um, or God would be open. Sorry. To having that type of relationship so because of that i've reassigned it's not 95 percent proven for premise six it's 100 percent proven for premise six uh so yeah the atheist is crushing it and killing it we've got one premise left premise eight proper in that we'll assess in part two the empirical premise and uh if this argument is going to work for atheism uh that has to be over 50 percent proven true uh, hopefully, as theists, we're going to be saying, no, it's it's improbable to be true. It's not a sound premise. It's not a deductively strong premise. And we're having to rely all on our assessment of premise eight to defeat this argument or to see if the atheist is right, if it succeeds. Does it prove that God is a real maximum great being does not exist? We'll find out in part two. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give you that quick update. Premise six uh, so unfortunately, I screwed up. I didn't realize the distinction between real seeker and uh, non-resistant non-believer uh, about the capability when I was doing my biblical assessment about sanctification and that. That's all irrelevant stuff because this is assuming, look, these are capable real seekers or non-resistant non-believers. They are capable of the higher level relationship. And obviously, God would be open in the minimalist sense of the word as we're defining it to those higher level relationships. So this is this is 100% proven true in my opinion. You can't have the same level, high level relationship um, if you have a lesser degree of belief, uh, dedicto belief on a balance of probabilities. If you lack that, your relationship is diminished. You may still have some kind of conscious relationship, but it's not to the same degree. And God would always, as a real maximum great being, God would always be open to that, the better relationships for any real seekers or non-resistant non-believers who are capable of those higher relationships, at least. So yeah, that's it. I'll shut up and take care.